Well, I've known Spay for many years. I think I must have met him in the mid-70s. He actually, I got a job as assistant editor at Opera News, and then my first real encounter with Spate was at my desk, which turned out to have been his desk when he had the same job, sort of two people before me. And I found a piece of yellow, a pad, yellow legal pad with his uh, uh, unmissable scrawl all over it. And I tried to read it and thought, what mad person wrote this? Well, he came to me, I think, just before he started in Seattle, and he, uh, he offered me, he said he wanted me to do a show. Um, and it really was the first uh, offer I'd gotten to, wor to work in a big theater in the States. Um, and it was exciting because I, uh, you know, it was, it was at the beginning of my career and, you know, I was thinking this was going to be a swell thing to do and suddenly I was going to be directing Yanufa in, you know, 1985, at that point, a distant year. <laughs> and um, so he came to my apartment down in the village and he sat down and he said, well, I, I, just, have some, I just have some things I have to ask you. And <laughs> we started a, a very, uh, really a seminal friendship in my career, very important person, um, the producer that you dream about. There are always, I think probably in everyone's career, there are a few producers who really take an interest in, in growing you as an artist. And he was certainly uh, one of those few people for me. Spate is wildly involved in the process, um, which is the, uh, probably the most remarkable uh, or unusual thing about him. Um, and there are many unusual things about him, but that's a particularly unusual one. He spends a lot of time in rehearsal. Um, and I think I can safely say that aside from certain, you know, money disaster years during his tenure, he spends more time in rehearsal than not. In other words, most of the rehearsal time, he is there. Um, on, a, on a work day, he will come down in the lunch hour. He will often take half the day down there. He will come in the evening. Um, he goes home, he makes dinner for his family, and they eat, and then he comes back to rehearsal. And um, he is a very invasive presence there, uh, but I have to say, not intrusive, ever. Um, we were fortunate in forging a friendship at the same time that we were forging a working relationship, and the friendship always outpaced the working relationship and uh, kept, has kept doing so. So we're, I'm delighted to have him there. I love his uh, mind. He has wonderful, spontaneous, rather earthy responses um, and a tremendous web of uh, intricate knowledge of the piece that you're working on. So as a producer, he is more than just, you know, the guy who runs the company. He's actually a producer who gets in there and says, what are you doing? I don't understand that moment. Well, that, you know, in the theater, that's what I grew up on. And I was lucky enough to have a couple of other producers who did that all the time, I mean, to a maddening degree, but thrillingly, so that you really were forced to articulate better and more clearly what it was you were aiming for and how you were doing it. And that relationship um, is one that I've had with Spate. So, I'm so lucky. I don't think, I mean, I can't think of another um, person in his position who is so, so much on that beat. And I can only speak for myself. I don't, I know he has very close relationships with a few directors who've worked, at the, worked there many times. But I don't know how he works with each of them. But for me, he was one of those people. Someone who helped me clarify and identify who I was as an artist over many, many years. That was the first 
um, big new production. It was in 1988, and Mark Morris and his original group, I mean by original, I mean the Mark Morris dance group that went to Belgium after that, um, Mark and his dancers were the choreographer and the dancers, and he also appeared in the show. Um, and that, I think, was the first show that that Spate did that it was a it was a new production which received a lot of national press and and put the put Spate as a producer on the map in a funny way because it was a it was a regie theater kind of production rather than a uh, a rental that had been spruced up. Um, and it was the first time that he had really done something brand new. Spade had the show in mind. He wanted to do the, what I understand to be, the U.S. premiere of the French version of Orphée with tenor for Vincent Cole and Sherry Greenewald. And, um, he, and, and he had the idea to put me and Mark together. And uh, so, it, you know, as always, he's very much a team player. Um, I met a lot with Mark without Spate, and we worked through a way of, of telling the story and using the dance at certain places. And, um, and then we all got together, and Mark worked in one room, and I worked in another. And Mark also worked in advance in New York in his studio. Um, that was such a great experience also because I had the opportunity to sit and watch Mark work for, you know, on and off for a year or so before we went into rehearsal on other ballets. And it, it, it made a huge impression on me it, it, and an impact on the way I, I think the way I move bodies in space ultimately, something that already was a, a very particularly moving part of my work for me. Um, anyway, so that was a fantastic opportunity that spaced through my way. But then of course we got into rehearsal and and it was it was also the first time that the that we had that spate, I say we because I feel so much part of the Seattle Opera family now, I, I call the company we. Um, but it was the first time that the company had done a production which was experimental in, in a sense. Now I say Régie Théâtre and experimental like I'm that kind of director and I, I don't know whether that's true. I don't think of myself particularly as either. But it was a bold uh, way of presenting the show was not in you know traditional 18th century dress. It was not in a vision of classical antiquity. It was, it was a sort of modern dress in front of a huge sculptured wall, and um, with a few moving pieces. And um, we we staged the overture, and then we cut it after the dress rehearsal. After the dress rehearsal, we decided that we did not have the right clothes for the chacon, the big mark dance at the end and we had to redesign everything. We were up until four in the morning and everybody thought I was a nutcase. And Spate was the life of the party. Four in the morning, just like, well, I think we'll have to do this, that, and the other thing, and it'll all be fine, and then you do this, and you do that, and we'll all talk tomorrow. And, you know, just incredibly in his element, absolutely in his element, making this thing happen, learning, obviously, at that point, you know, about how it worked and how the pieces fit together, but just mine going 100,000 miles an hour, picking everything up, anticipating problems, just being a brilliant uh, and un an extremely spontaneous collaborator, uh, creative collaborator. Um, and, and it, with a, with a, that element that Spade has of being comp of seeming sort of nuts, slightly wild and sort of nuts, with so many ideas just sort of tumbling around, um, and such good cheer, and so much, so many layers of intelligence underneath it, and so many layers of of uh, knowledge about operatic history, and a, and a very good sense for operatic dramaturgy. He's a really good, he's good value as a collaborator. Really good. Um, so that was Orfe, and it was, uh, it turned out to be a tremendous success. And, the, and it, because of the nature of the project and the, and, the, and the risk that it represented for Spate to schedule, you know, that piece, which was called Orpheus, 
Um, and it was a tremendous hit. And the company bought into it. So it became an experience which many of the, a lot of the, there are several people still who work in the administration at the office who were in the chorus at that time, who were old friends, Monty Jacobson in uh, PR and Sarah Potter in, uh, in the, the music administration. And these people, you know, all were there. They were both in the Inufa chorus. So those people are often around, and, and I went through a lot of shows with them. And, and then they moved into other capacities. And it's the beauty of, of working in a company. And Spade is extremely loyal, not only with artists that he uh, enjoys being with as people and whose work he enjoys, but also with his uh, staff. Well, I, you know, I don't think I, I don't know whether someone else would have thought to offer me a Wagner opera. I wasn't particularly Mr. Wagner, and, um, but Spate did early on. About a year after Orpheus, we did A Dutchman in 89, and again he asked for a new production. Again he put it on a slot, which was the same slot as Orpheus over Christmas, and I think that there was something like 16 days on which I had any kind of rehearsal including tech and chorus. And I had 250 extras in the Orpheus in one scene. So I'm not sure exactly how we did all that, especially with you know cutting the overture and changing the clothes and the last thing. Um, Dutchman, we'd learned a little bit about that pattern. But um, you know, I knew that for Spade, uh, an offer of a Wagner opera had, had particular significance, and this was um, an ideal opportunity for me to find my way into this repertoire. Not that at that point I figured I'd do much more than Dutchman. I had no particular aspirations as a Wagnerian. But um, we, we put that together, and quite excitingly, and we, we updated it uh, as well. Um, and again, I say we. It was the first, no, Orpheus was the first show that I did with Tom Lynch, Marty Pakladinas doing clothes, and Peter Kazarowski doing lights. And we've since done, I mean, we still work together as a team um, and have done so regularly since 23 years ago. Uh, that was the first time we were together. And so there was also a wonderful sense on Orpheus of discovering, discovering that, that um, collaboration and the sort of artistic excitement of the way we worked together. In Dutchman, we had Tom and Peter again, and it was Dunya Ramikova did the close. And um, it was a thrilling, thrilling project, and it went off quite well. Uh, we were all pretty happy with that. We also had two casts. You know, we had two Dutchmans and two Zentas, I think, and two Eriks. Can you imagine? So it was, it, I don't know how we thought we were doing that. I think we, we were younger, and we, you know, uh, necessity and, and, and time crunch was the mother of invention. Time crunch now is just the mother of panic for me. I, I, <laughs> I need more time as I get longer and longer in the tooth. But um, Dutchman was great, and then I did Lohengrin in, in 94. That was the first time that I did a summer production, and in that situation we had a festival setting uh, which Spate has made possible for uh, what you could only refer to as a real exploration of, of a piece. It's not just rehearsal. It's a real, it's, it's much more European in the sense that over a longer period of rehearsal time and, and rehearsal and in a, in a kind of uh, oh, almost vacation-like setting in the summer where Seattle is at its most glorious, um, you really sit with a piece for a while, and it, there's a wonderful feeling of, of, of luxury with that. Um, and that's also the luxury that we had, uh, obviously, working into the ring. I remember that doing Lohengrin, I said to Spade at one time, I knew that he was planning on doing a new ring. He had done a uh, sort of pickup ring initially that he had somewhat inherited, at least scenically, and, um, and then he'd done Francois Rocher. He had a very close relationship with Francois, a wonderful director from Switzerland, and um, he had done the first spate ring in 1985-6, I think it was. 
So in 95, he wanted to do a new, a new ring. And um, I said, I know you're planning this. I've heard this. And as I was working on the floor in, in Lohengrin, I, I realized that I was walking on the blueprint for the ring, Wagner-wise. And it was the first time that I had ever imagined. I remember, there was, I remember the moment. I just sort of went, oh, this is the ring, you know, in embryo on some level. There's certain techniques that Wagner is playing with. That, and suddenly I understood something about the ring, which, of course, I'd been sort of, you know, familiar with in this or that way, but rather selectively and randomly over the course of my life. But I never really you know, made a study of it. And again, God forbid I should ever direct it. Who would be such a fool? So I, uh, or so presumptuous as to think that one could. <laughs> so I said, I'll only say this once, but I am interested. And eventually he, um, he couldn't decide who to hire for that ring because he had several, I think four people that he was extremely uh, interested in and whom, with whom he had worked and with whom he found it stimulating to work. And, the, and this is so revealing about him. So what he did was he said, I have a notion about nature in the ring. I would like to have each of you, he wrote a letter to each of us, um, write to me your thoughts about that idea. Where does it take you? And then everybody, or I presume, I don't know, but I, I remember sitting on a plane on one of my endless cross-country uh, trips and, and writing this pretty deranged sort of free associative thing about the ring, which went on and on and on. But it was, um, it was also kind of a letter to Spate. It was a letter to my friend about it and a letter to someone that I knew was versed in a lot of the things that I knew about, too. And it was such a thrill to spend that time um, thinking about it and making connections about it. A lot of which were there to be made if I had just thought to do it or you know, had the occasion to do it. But So it was fun. And uh, eventually, lucky me, he chose me to do it. And, and that obviously is its own saga. You know, there's the story of Stephen and Spate being buddies, and there's the story of Stephen and Seattle Opera and Spate and various productions, and then there's The Ring, which looms like a great scary Mack truck coming down the highway every four years at us. It's scarily close now, and we're still two years out. But um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge thing to do the ring. And we took care, you know, one of the things, he really always has been so, he's championed my way of doing things. And this is another thing that's really important in a producer. Because opera, you know, has a, there's a certain tradition of putting operas on in this country. If we go back even 25 years, we're looking at a, an art form that had a very different profile. But even now, uh, by comparison with, with the general approach in Europe, um, generalized, I'm generalizing. Uh, let's cut that. Let's just say that there is a very big difference between the way we tend to look at things now in a new production and the expectations of what will happen in that rehearsal room than there were 25, even 15 years ago in this country. Um, it's something that's gradually evolving, and I think in a healthy direction, um, uh, even though you know everyone can throw up their arms and say, too much this, too little that. Well, remember the days when Zinka Milanov just stood there, it was so great, or, you know, whatever that is. Um, but Spate is someone who cultivates uh, the people that he enjoys working with um, and it, by enjoying the way they work. If he trusts you, he trusts you. And then he will stand up for you to make it possible for you to work out with his company a way to do it the way you need, the way you think it's going to work best. And, you know, ask anybody the stories about Stephen doing the schedule for the ring. I mean, I do the daily schedule. I start at least two years in advance. 
because that is the way that I can spell out the use of time. And it's crazy, it used to lock me in this office next to uh, Spate's office, which was called ominously the shower room because for some reason there was a shower in it. And it was a sort of office where people waited or where meetings went or whatever. And they would literally put me in there, lock the door, and give me a boom box and food and leave me there to like create this insane schedule with you know all of it, literally hour by hour with five different rooms going so that we could really we could really mastermind and then troubleshoot and then redo and then troubleshoot and then redo so that we could get maximum usage of time to so that we could be sure that we could do the scene work do the real scene work uh, between the people which is like the the basis of it, but when you do a project that big, the chances of getting any scene work done, as anyone, as everyone knows, in a in a big company, even if it's on holiday, just putting on two or four ring operas, and not the Met, where God forbid you're also putting on a number of other works of art, um, it's really hard, and it's it's hard to get to that nuts and bolts acting, thinking about how music and words work together collaborative feeling in the room. So that's what I'm always trying to protect, and that's what Spate helped me protect. And we had some really hard times with, with his staff sometimes, where they would just throw up their hands and go, Stephen is driving me nuts. And he would get right in there. He loves to mediate. And he would get in, and he would make us talk to each other and understand how this was going to work. And, and you know, it's just, just a dream. Well, Spate, <laughs> Spate called me up and said, well, I just have to do a new opera before I retire. I mean, I have to do it, so, and I haven't done it. And I should have done it, but I haven't done it. And, um, and he said, uh, so I've decided you're going to write the libretto and direct. And I said, well, I think that's uh, premature. Let's slow down here. Let's go back a step. Let's talk about finding a, a, a person to write this music who you can have a relationship with that you enjoy because this is something which I had learned over time is really important to him and moreover let's find out what that person needs to write about as opposed to you know getting a, a property with a with a name title that people you know people will buy into and come to and and then getting then hiring someone to make that that's a different way of going at it I said let's find a composer that you like and then let's figure out what that person needs to write about. And then we'll figure out who should write the libretto, who should direct it, blah, blah, blah. He was like, OK. So, <laughs> so we listened. I said, let's sit down and listen to you know, something like 40 pieces of opera in English. I'd say 95% of them American operas um, written in the last 50 years. And we shows a whole wide variety of them. We listened to them, and I sort of created this mad grading system where we could, so that we could discuss in each one of them how, what we felt about word setting, about the setting of the vocal line vis-a-vis -vis the orchestra, about the, the writing for the voice, and X number of other things having to do with the musical side, as well as the way the drama was laid out, um, the way the story was told, the freshness of the dramaturgy, the, you know. So, so sort of try to assess on all these different uh, criteria what we've really felt were the, the best achievements, the, the ones that worked the best. Uh, and we did that, and we came up with a few composers that began to emerge for Spate as being the most uh, interesting to him for what he thought his audience would respond to. Um, and he's very keen sense of that. I, I don't know of, of another impresario in this country, probably in the world, who has a closer or more loving relationship with his audience. Uh, when they first did Turn of the Screw, which must have been in the early to mid-90s, he decided that it was a bit of a risk uh, and he wasn't sure how it would go over. He hadn't done that much 20th century opera. He, did, he, was, he himself had, had not known the piece, I think, as a younger opera person. Um, and he decided to do a talk back after every single show. Well, 
it was such a hit that he's done it after every single show, including Gutter Demeron. For as long as people will sit there, which is a long time, and they flock down to the lower lobby at the opera, and they sit there, and Spate leads a sort of discussion, Q&A. It takes questions and comments from the audience about it. And sometimes artists drop by and, and, and talk to, I've done it. But it's really phenomenal. The, the, the interface between Spate and that community in terms of live time, in the flesh time, and, um, and, and radio time, and all of it is, is uh, second to none, and has, of course, been part of, of his insanely successful audience building. I mean, we did what? I don't know. We did four performances of Yanufa or something like that. Now they do, you know, eight, nine performances of Amelia, new piece. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And the audience just like, <laughs> on up. Spate walks out in front of the curtain at the beginning of a dress rehearsal, and they, he has an ovation. At the end of Go to Demerung in um, 95, I think the first time, the second time that we did the complete ring, I decided that I, I couldn't take the last bow, which fell to me just through the sort of standard, and that I had to, to go get Spate. So after I took my bow, I made a gesture to the audience, and I went to the side of the stage, and we had arranged that he be there, and I pulled him out on stage, and I've never in my life heard an ovation like that. Not for, you know, Leontine Price's farewell. Never in my life have I heard a noise like that audience made. I think every single person in that auditorium yelled. And this was, this was a city saying to this man, thank you for, for giving us this incredible, um, these years of, uh, of loving curating of an art form that we had no idea we loved so much. It was, it was phenomenal. In 2009, I thought it couldn't be topped, but we took him out again at the end of that ring. And it's just, it's just one of the happiest ex uh, memories of my life in the theater is bringing him out on that stage and seeing that audience. This l funny little guy who's like, you know, who's so not the person who expects that, needs that, wants that, you know? Um, and it was all we could do to get him up there, and you sort of have to pull him out, and you pull him out, and he looks all sheepish and smiles, and he couldn't be more pleased, obviously. But, wow, what a thing. What a thing to listen to that, and how instructive to listen to that. I wish everybody in Washington could watch that part of that tape where you pull that curator out on the stage and the audience, and that audience makes that noise. Because that's not a small house, right? And that's a lot of American people of all different kinds saying yes to art. There was a lot of talk about what to work on, and then I took on a different role as a sort of dramaturg, and ultimately as a sort of co-writer um, when Spate was feeling, well, you know, they have some great ideas, but I'm not feeling that the way they're shaping a narrative around those ideas is right for my audience. And I said, well, let me ask them if I could take a shot at, right? So I ended up making a story out of some elements of theirs and a few elements of my own and then gave it back to them without really knowing whether they would, uh, they being Darren and uh, Gardner McFall, wonderful poet who wrote the libretto. And they, I think it rang their chimes enough. We had some bones of contention. We, we hammered that out and argued it back and forth for a while and ended up with, with something that all three of, of, of all three of us and Spate were ready to move forward with. And that was, you know, a couple of a few years of work, and then the making of the opera and the putting together. I worked with Darren and Gardner throughout the writing of it to meet together and say mm -hmm, mm -hmm, questions, mm -hmm. and then um, and then we did the production. So we also, you know, uh, so in the in the on the project, I, I sort of functioned as an advisor to Spade initially about how to go about a commission. I've been in on a few, and I've certainly seen a lot of that going on, and I had some thoughts about 
how it might be most uh, efficiently and uh, carefully uh, brought off and um, with a time frame that, that would really make sense and would take as much pressure off the actual rehearsal period as possible. We had a very successful uh, workshop a year in advance. Um, and all of this Spate presided over with his uh, typical enthusiasm and, um, and sort of very enterprising, lots of big ideas, and suddenly emails in the middle of the night. I, I, I'm thinking about this and, uh, and I'm just not happy about that. And, uh, you know, whatever it was. Uh, but again, as always, really proactive, not waiting around, not, not at all a sort of passive player. And he's not afraid to say, you know, well, I think this, even if it's what he thinks. And I look at him half the time, I'm like, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And he's like, well, really, why? So then we talk it through, whatever, you know. And, but the great thing is that he says it. And what it takes the measure of is where he is with it. There's nothing that can go on that stage and go off that stage. I mean, he's got to go downstairs and account to those people for every single moment of that show in his mind. So he has to own it. That's unique. The Young Artist Program was something that Spate also felt was a sort of, it was mandated that he do it in his mind. He felt that it was something that he had to develop. Obviously, there are attractive things about a young artist program for a company. Cheap labor, um, new faces, uh, the, the excitement of being involved with people who are up and coming and might be extremely up. Um, for example, uh, Brandon Jovanovich or, or Larry Brownlee, and there are certainly others that have been through that program who have done well for themselves. Um, but aside from that, I, I didn't have a lot to do with it initially. I mean, obviously, we talked about it because this is another area of my work that, that you know, Spate obviously knew about. So we did do a lot of talking, but ultimately, my old pal, Peter Cazares, who made his debut in UNUFA at Seattle and sang many, many, many different things there and now has directed there and teaches there. You know, he, he's my best friend from college. He was my best man at my wedding. He's the best. Anyway, so Peter stepped in there, and, um, and I know that Peter has played a, also a very important role as a kind of advisor to Spate in a funny way, someone that Spate really relies on for, for advice about a lot of things. As he, you know, he needs, he needs strong people just like we need him to help him uh, learn more about what exactly he wants and how to articulate it better. And this is, you know, it's a, it's a collaboration that, that he doesn't just send in your direction. It works two ways. And it, that's, you know, it's, it's just such a brilliant relationship for me on so many levels. And it's, so, it's such a heartening one because there's so many professional relationships with people who are, you know, the producing company, who represent the producing company, but don't really want to be in the room or don't really have anything to offer you. The initial memory of the after the dress rehearsal of Orpheus, we're all sitting down in I think the orchestra's lounge having the, the, the meeting. And after every of the stage rehearsals, there's a meeting that goes on until it's over, which the production stage manager runs, or the production manager runs, and everybody from the production is there, and everybody's notes are considered, and the director goes first, and you give all your notes about tech, and the conversation can go on, and these meetings make everyone cross-eyed, and many fritos are eaten, but um, I, have, I still believe that they make uh, all the difference, um, because they're exhaustive, they're detail-oriented, and even though we're all at the end of our ropes, it, there's something so important about the gesture and, uh, of, of Spade insisting that they happen so that the company designers, I mean, we're talking about all the, the people involved with running the rehearsal, 
wigs, makeup, you name it, everybody. And everybody sits there and everybody discusses the notes. And there are times when I would give $150 million not to be there. But the fact is that they make a huge difference. Um, anyway, where were we? I was just talking about something else before that. Oh, yeah, the Orpheus. The, so sitting down in the orchestra, the old orchestra musician's lounge, having that meeting and announcing that I was going to cut the, the overture. And Gretchen Mueller, the stage manager, her eyes were, got as big as sandwich plates. I thought she was going to kill me. And Spate was like, wow, well, okay. <laughs> I thought, okay, we're going to cut the overture. Um, now, what does that entail? So there's lots of talking. And then, um, and then the next big uh, bombshell was, and I think, I think the costumes for the Chacon are wrong. You think they're wrong, you know, from the, I think they're wrong. I, I, I think we have, we just have to get them right. We have to change them, you know. So we did. Um, but watching Spate sit back in, in a, what, in a, just so joyous at these moments of, I mean, head against the wall, crashing crisis, and he's just lit and on it, you know, at, in some way at his absolute best. The lawyer, you know, the, the, the charmer, the diplomat, the opera lover, the, you know, uh, the sort of opera historian, all these people sitting there in one body with this great big beaming face, um, solving problems and making people get along. That's, that's a, you know, that's a, there's, a, there's a message in his being, in, in the way he is for people that work with him, which is about, we do this. And um, probably that's the hugest thing about him the most important thing of all. And he certainly has made a contribution to cultural life in this country that's profound. But I think that everybody who, who has had the pleasure of, of working with him, I mean, sees that in everything he does. And it's not about spade. It just isn't. He doesn't, it's, not, it's the furthest thing from his mind.